What a joy it is for us as Catholics to get to celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Defined as a dogma way back in 1854, this has been a belief of the faithful going back all the way to the beginning of the Christian faith. And as we think about what it is we're celebrating, what we recognize is Jesus' most perfect work. Far from competing with her son for our redemption, she participates in the grace of salvation more fully than all of us. And she is the means by which each and every one of us enters into that special grace and mercy that her son gives to us through her. This came to me, I remember, way back when I was thinking about the Gospel of John and how it is that the New Testament uses the old and how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed and fulfilled in the new. Because you can tell from the beginning that John is looking at the incarnational debut of Jesus in terms of Genesis, especially Genesis 1 and 2. From the very opening line of the prologue of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on to describe how all things came into existence through Christ, the Word. And then, of course, he also tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But far from dropping out uh, or abandoning that Genesis typology, he continues on into chapter 2, building up to a sort of climax, the same way you find in Genesis 1, culminating in chapter 2. Because in Genesis 1, we read in the beginning and how God created it was through the power of his word and all things came into existence day one, day two, the next day, the next day, until, of course, we come to the creation of man as male and female on day six. But man is made male on day six. And then after the deep sleep, we read in Genesis 2 that he awakens to discover the female. Woman, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. And so the marital covenant of the old Adam and Eve that basically culminates the old creation of the old covenant anticipates what John is doing in chapters 1 and 2. Because as we look carefully at John 1, we see a sequence where the phrase, the next day, the next day occurs again and again. First in verse 29, and then again in verse 35, and then in verse 43. The next day, the next day, the next day, leading us to day 4. And then as we look at chapter 2, verse 1, we read on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now, the third day from what? Well, the last day that was mentioned. Since the last day was mentioned was day 4, three days later bring us to the seventh day. So just as we found in Genesis 1 and 2, the climax of the old creation is the unveiling of the marital covenant of Adam and Eve, created without original sin. So we have in John 1 and 2, the new creation of the new covenant, revealing the new Adam and the new Eve, because there on the third day, the wedding at Cana in Galilee, which is the seventh day of this new creation week, we don't we don't have information about the bride and groom. In fact, none of the characters are identified except for Jesus and Mary. But he doesn't call her Mary. He doesn't call her mother. He calls her woman using the same Greek term that Adam uses in the Greek translation of Genesis 2. So this is how the early church fathers came to understand that John's point is to present Jesus as the new Adam and the Blessed Virgin Mary as the new Eve. And Jesus' incarnation is ordered to doing nothing less than a, a new creation, a new covenant, not just salvaging what is there in the old, but transforming and elevating it to share in the divine in a way that was hitherto unsuspected, unforeseen. And so just as we all agree that uh, Adam and Eve were created without original sin, and we all agree as Christians that the new Adam was formed without original sin, how fitting it is for us as Catholics to recognize that the new Eve, like the new Adam, is conceived without original sin. Not by anything that she accomplishes on her own power, but precisely through the merits of Jesus Christ. She is his redemptive masterpiece, and therefore she participates in the grace of his redemptive work more perfectly than we can conceive. And so when we look at these texts and traditions, when we consider how the new and the old are correlated in this mysterious manner, I think we can see, you know, first of all, that Mary is certainly a model believer. She trusts her son, and she tells the servants there at Cana to do likewise, do whatever he tells you. But besides a model believer who trusts and obeys, 
The second thing she is, is the mother of our Lord. As we read in Luke 1, when Elizabeth greets her kinswoman, Mary, she asks, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So besides being a model for all believers, she is uniquely called to be the mother of God, as the Council of Ephesus defined her to be in 431, as Elizabeth describes her to be in Luke 1. But more than that, she is also the masterpiece of Jesus Christ. She is his redemptive masterpiece. You know, when you go to an art exhibit and the artist happens to be there, he won't be offended or slighted if instead of staring at him, you behold all of his works and spend more time appreciating his greatest masterpiece of all. And so on this feast of the Immaculate Conception, we are beholding with gratitude and joy Jesus Christ's greatest work of our salvation, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary. We're also advised to look at the Catechism because the teaching of the Catechism in paragraphs 490 to 493, that teaching does a marvelous job of summarizing this mystery of faith, especially in paragraph 492, where we read the splendor of an entirely unique holiness by which Mary is enriched from the first instant of her conception comes wholly from Christ. She is redeemed in a more exalted fashion by reason of the merits of her son. That's a great point. She is not sinless and therefore not in need of a redeemer. She is sinless precisely because she is more fully and perfectly redeemed than anybody else and thus graced to participate in Christ's redemptive work more fully than anybody else. It's a non-competitive enterprise. It isn't a tug of war. It really is a case of participating in what Christ has come to give us. It doesn't detract in any way from Jesus. In fact, it refracts the light that comes into the world so that in her we can see all of the colors of the rainbow, as it were, as we do with all of the saints as well. So let's prepare ourselves to really enter into the joy and the mystery of the Immaculate Conception with the help of the scriptures and the, teach and the teaching of the church in the Catechism.